Lord, I need more of you and less of me today. As we finish up this marvelous book of Revelation, I ask you humbly in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Alas, it is the last joke of the Revelation series. You'll be all right. When Fred arrived at the pearly gates, there was hardly any line, and he didn't have to wait more than a minute before his interview, naturally. He was a little nervous about getting through the gates and into the heavenly city. Very quickly, he found himself standing before an impressive, angelic being with a clipboard who started getting his entry data down. After name, address, and a few other particulars, the angelic being said, Fred, it would help the process, if you could share with me some experience from your life on earth when you did a purely unselfish, kindly deed. Well, Fred thought for about a minute and then said, oh yes, I think I have something you might be interested in. One day I was walking along and came upon a little older lady who was being mercilessly beaten up by a huge motorcycle gang type fellow. He was smacking her back and forth while I just stepped right up and first I pushed over his motorcycle just to distract him. And then I kicked him real hard in the shins. And then I told the older lady to run for help. And then I hauled off and I gave this guy a shot right to the gut with my fist. The bee looked at Fred with a great deal of interest. He said, wow, that's quite a story. I'm very impressed. Could you tell me just when this happened? Fred looked at his watch and said, about two minutes ago. <laughs> Man, that's not a very good passage. That is for Easter. It's okay because you've been in Revelation for a while. Congratulations. You have made it through all the trials, the tribulations, all the beasts and the battles. We finally made it to our heavenly home. Did you wonder if we would ever get there? After 25 messages, did you wonder when it was 20 below zero, dark and cold outside, had they canceled church, probably should have canceled church, who knows? Did you wonder if we'd make it? I don't know, sometimes. But last week we caught full view of our heavenly home. From the outside, we gazed upon the brilliant beauty and the stunning size of chapter 21 of Revelation. We walked with an angel, the 1,400 mile length, width, and height. Now just to give you some perspective of how big the city is that we saw last week and we'll hear into today. I live in a house that's two stories tall. Okay, one, two. The tallest building in the world is in Dubai. It's 209 stories tall. The story is between 10 and 13 feet high, roughly. The building in Dubai is 209 stories tall. In the New Jerusalem, where we will spend eternity, it will be 735,000 stories high and wide and long about you. But I suppose a fair portion of forever with my family will be spent in the elevators going up and down as my boys press all the buttons. <laughs> Eternity needs to be that long for us to get there. But today, in our last text, we will get to peek inside the super city, this mega metropolis and feast our eyes. Let's go there right now. If you have your Bibles, I would love it if you would open them up almost to the max. Okay, we're going all the way to the back of your Bible today. We're going to finish it up. Chapter 22 in the wonderful book of Revelation. I'm going to start with reading verses 1 through 6. You know, if you just got here today and you're thinking, man, I don't even have a Bible. There's Bibles in the pews that are there for you to use. If you don't have a Bible that you can read and understand, we would invite you to take that home and call it your own. 
love when God's people can open up God's word. If you don't have it, how are you going to do that? So open it right now with us and follow along and then take it home and be blessed by it. Verses 1 through 6 is where I'm going to start in chapter 22. Did you get there yet? Verses 1 through 6, chapter 22. In the book of Revelation, it's on page 1368 in the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the Lamb or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants things that must soon take place. Almost home as you shown the title of Revelation 22. On your outline, the river flows waters and new Eden. The river flows. Now we find ourselves inside this fabulous city. And surprise, surprise, it's an enclosed garden with a beautiful river and a tree of life. The beginning and the end of time have come together. The mysterious garden of Eden, which I personally believe was destroyed in the flood, has been reset right here. The tree of life has been replanted for all to enjoy in the midst of a sprawling city. Can I just make one confession today? Really? Yes. Thanks. I was hoping. I usually enjoy what I do. Though I was raised in the country, I have always loved living in town, being in the city. I especially love being in Amsterdam when I lived there with hundreds of thousands of other people. And yet on my daily commute to work in Amsterdam, I would ride my bicycle through Vondel Park, a beautiful park with trees and canals. And for me, the country boy, who loved living in the city. It was the perfect blend for me. And it will be that in eternity as well. There is a much deeper element of Eden that will enliven everything. And it's captured in the first seven words of verse 3. Look at the first seven words of verse 3. If that don't give you goosebumps, it really should. The first seven words of verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. I'm not sure I can fully comprehend those words. Without context. So we're going to have you do a little bit of Bible calisthenics. I'm going to have you turn your Bible all the way to the front. Genesis 3. Okay? This isn't too hard. You're in the back of the Bible. Now you're in the front of the Bible. Genesis 3. Because sometimes we may wonder what's all this curse about. Let me just break down the curse for you really fast. I'm in Genesis chapter 3. It's page 6 in your student Bible. And I'm going to start at verse 17. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. It's worth it once you get there. Okay. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. To Adam he said, Now remember, we're in the Garden of Eden. They just ate the apple. It wasn't really an apple. It was fruit. Here we go. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate of the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. 
Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Oh, friends, I believe we encounter three things, and you can write them on your outline if you want to. Three elements of the curse, painful toil, a sweaty brow, and a return to dust. I just want you to imagine with me, just for a minute or two, the painful toil being gone. The physical load you need to lift every day so that you can make ends meet. The physical workload, the painful toil that you go through. I remember when I was a kid uh, working on the farm with Uncle Herman. And he was in his early 60s. And we had to shovel out a corn crib. Is there anybody that's ever shoveled out a corn crib? Perfect. We had to shovel out this corn crib, and I remember after about 10 or 15 minutes of this, I turned to Uncle Herman, and I was like, Uncle Herman, man, my back is starting to hurt. Don't your back hurt? Mine's starting to hurt. And he kept shoveling, and he just looked at me, and he's like, my back always hurts. You can keep shoveling. <laughs> Oil. Imagine a day without it. How about this? Imagine a day without the mental burden you need to bear. The sweaty brow. That mental burden that clouds your concentration by day and steals your sleep at night. I know. Physical toil causes you to sweat. And mental toil causes you to sweat for more. Can you imagine a day without the mental burden, the sweaty ground? But then there's ultimate relief from the curse. That return to dust. Can you imagine a day without that fear of the last breath or fear of death? This is what Jesus started on Easter Sunday morning. This is what he will complete with us in eternity right here. The dread of death haunts us as we get older. The anti-aging industry generates millions of dollars in profits with the hopes of stalling the look of age and the look of death. But friends, you need to know today that only the tree of life <coughs> will give you that. And you can't get it here yet. But someday you will. But even more profound than bringing death. The curse separated us from God. We were ejected from Eden and lost our face-to-face -face relationship with our Creator. But now we're back home again. Welcomed by the Father whose face we will finally see. Now in your text, you need to know that we've covered the light source and the forever factor in other sermons. So for application, I just want to dream with you a little bit. I think at Easter especially, it's good to dream about eternity. I want you to think about godly people in your life that have loved you like Jesus. I want you to just think about them. If they're living or if they, they've gone ahead of you home. I want you to think about those godly people in your life that have loved you like Jesus. What their eyes look like. What their smile look like. What their laugh sound like. You see, friends, I believe when we finally see God face to face, He'll be familiar. It won't be like meeting a stranger. Rather, it'll be like meeting an old friend you've known for years but you haven't seen for a long time. You see, we talk a lot about the what of heaven, the pearly gates, the 
golden streets, but more importantly is the who that's inside those pearly gates. Do you want to go see? Are you ready to go see? Even if you need to go see today. I hope you are. Because check out verses 7 through 11. Verses 7 through 11. Back in Revelation 22. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard, when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and the prophets and all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. The angel knows that even John makes mistakes. That's what we're The angel knows that even John makes mistakes. I believe verse 7 booms out of heaven with the voice of Jesus. And it echoes in John's mind as he slowly returns to old earth. Our old world is, is coming back into view as his spirit-filled vision fades from his mind and perhaps his body. Jesus' words compel him to write down this book and receive the blessing that it contains. Now for those of you who have been here for a good chunk of this sermon series, you may be experiencing a little bit of biblical deja vu. You'd be like, hey, I thought we've heard this before. Well, you did. Something very similar. It's from chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Now this is where I'm going to differentiate from most commentators and biblical scholars who believe that this is a typographical error or that a ancient scribe simply repeated and inserted this into the text. I don't believe that. Okay? I think it's in there for a reason. Here it is. You see, it's a beautiful example of an inspired disciple doing something dumb again. Okay? Chapter 19. John got down and started worshiping an angel. The angel said, don't do it. Get up. Worship God. I love it. To me, it's a great comfort to see John, the blessed revelator, the disciple Jesus loved, the writer of the gospel that bears his name, mess up twice in three chapters. It makes me happy. Because you know what? I mess up too. I mess up even in worship. I mess up at home. But you know what? It's okay. Because you just get corrected, get back up, and get worshiping in there. I think it's beautiful. Because you know, even John messed up. And when I mess up, I know that God can still use me. Verse 10 decisively differentiates the prophecy. Often prophecy is revealed for a later date, not revelation. It's a word for us for today. In verse 11, it tells us why. Because in light of this powerful prophetic word, those who do wrong and are vile will be exposed for who they are and their ultimate destiny. If you're all nasty, if you're doing bad things, your ultimate destiny is revealed in some very frightening ways. By the same token, if you are doing what is right and what is holy, you will experience similar judgment, but with a total opposite outcome. And those good and holy things flow from a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will often do vile and nasty things. It's just some hardcore truth that John wants to bring out to us. Application. 
I'm just wondering, what are the blessings that you have gained since opening this book? What personal revelations have you received from this book of revelation that helps you to be ready for eternity and even for today? Has this book helped you clarify what is wrong and vile and what is right and holy? I hope it has. If not, let's finish our last verses of the entire book of the Bible. I'm in verse 12, and we're going to read to the end. Here we go. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life. And they go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit is thirsty. Let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. The invitation goes, come for the free drink of grace. Come for the free drink of grace. Jesus steps up to the biblical microphone one more time to make things crystal clear. He's coming soon. Now, if you still scoff at that soon language, may I remind you that Jesus is talking from an eternal perspective, not from an earthly one. You say, hey, look, 2,000 years, that ain't soon. It's been a long time. What's going on? Well, in eternity, 2,000 years is a blink of the eye. What do I mean? Anybody remember the Mount of Trans Transfiguration? Of course, you'll remember it, but you've read about it, I hope. Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus went up with three of his disciples. Okay? He met two people up there. Who did he meet? Tell me. Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Moses died approximately 1400 B.C. Elijah died approximately 800 B.C. Jesus was alive approximately 30 A.D. How does that work? He was up there talking about it. Because you see, in eternity, time is different. Jesus has an eternal perspective on time. So throw your watch away when you read Revelation. Because he is the beginning and the end. He's everywhere in between. And he cannot escape his perspective on eternity. Verses 14 and 15 are a common sense call of holy living. Wash is the active present tense. This is seeking God's forgiveness through the blood of Jesus that keeps us clean. It allows us to live forever because the tree inside the gates is there. So don't let sin keep you out of heaven. Dogs are a general term for unbelievers. Or people that just act like dogs. By embracing with love the falsehood of sin, don't get locked outside with the dogs. Verse 16, who is this to? It's to the churches. Remember way back at the beginning of the series? Those seven letters to those churches? This is to us. 
Oh friends, we need to know that our end game is set. Here it is, verse 17. I got called out by me this statement before, so I'll make it again. I believe if you are not regularly praying for an unbeliever, I doubt your salvation. Okay? And it's because of verse 17. Now, are you, dear bride, saying, come to anyone? And I don't necessarily mean bugging them constantly or banging them over the head with your Bible. Are you saying, come in your prayer life and asking the Lord that He would open the door for you to give an invitation to this person? To come to worship. To begin a relationship with Jesus. Bride, are you calling the people around you to come? Come. Get a drink of God's living water for you. Is Jesus calling you to say come? Are you ready for that moment you may be able to reflect the love and light of Jesus? to unbelievers around you. I hope you are. It's a thirsty world out there. Do people look at you? Do people look at your life? And do they say, hey, I think I'll have what they're drinking. It's a thirsty world, folks. Are you regularly refreshed by the free gift of the water of life? Because you can't give what you don't got. This is the essence and the core of evangelism. Just to be clear, verse 17 to the end, Jesus is back, or I'm sorry, John is back at the microphone, calling us to clear witness. And in verse 18 and 19, to exhaustive study. That's why I've taken you through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word for word. This entire revelation. Because I don't want you to miss the blessing. And I don't want to miss the blessing myself. I don't want to take any words away or add it to Verse 21 is a beautiful benediction. It talks about grace. Friends, we're living in the age of grace. After all, you've read and heard, preached, I hope you know. That the only way you can be ready for eternity is to embrace the grace of Jesus. Easter Sunday, we remember and celebrate Jesus' resurrection. But if that's all you do, you miss the point. You miss the point because Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection someday soon in the eternal sense. And that's found in Revelation. And that's the key to an eternal Easter that I hope you can celebrate every single day. Friends, there's no better time to begin or renew your relationship with Jesus. I would invite you to do it today as we pray together. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us these words in this book. Thank you for speaking to us. And Lord, for those who don't know you today, and perhaps who have only come from the tail end of this series, I pray, Lord Jesus, if your spirit is prompting them to begin a relationship with you, that they would. Lord, that you would prompt them to know that it is Simple, but not easy. We just need to admit that we're sinners, that our way is not the way that leads to eternal life, that leads to the tree of life. We're parched. Because we need something that we don't have, and only you can give. Or if we could just admit that we need the water of life to flow into us. Because it doesn't come from anywhere else. And then to simply believe that you are who you said you are in the Bible. And we see that Scripture points to you, Lord Jesus, all the way through. And especially at the end. 
Lord, that we would believe you are who you said you are, and that you're coming back again. Because you rose from the grave so long ago, but will come soon as well. Help us to believe that that's one of the most important part. Because people believe a lot of stuff, and they admit a lot of stuff, but it comes to commitment. Lord, I pray that someone here today would commit their lives to follow me. Maybe there's someone who has been protected for years. But today it's different. Today your spirit is saying you need to be serious now. Oh Lord, that they will commit their lives to following you and know the power of your resurrection every Sunday. I ask this all in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord and eternal Savior. Amen.